it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Professor Anna Stewart from Griffith University. Uh, Professor Stewart is the head of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Griffith University and founder of the program Justice Modelling at Griffith. Professor Stewart received her PhD from the University of Queensland in 1994 with her thesis, An Investigation of Decision Making by Child Protection Workers. Since then, she has been interested in the research uses of government administrative data and she has examined the longitudinal contact individuals have with child protection, youth justice, the adult criminal justice system, system responses to youth offending and domestic violence, management of risk, diversionary responses and system modelling. Professor Stewart has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications government reports and other papers and is involved in partnerships attracting over four million dollars in national competitive funding, consultancies and other government research funding. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Anna Stewart. First of all, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. It's really great to be here. And I'd like to thank the AIC and the Queensland Police, well, the AIC for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about our work, and the Queensland Police, um, especially Commissioner Stewart, for all the lovely things he said about us, Griffith University, and the collaborations um, between Griffith University and the Queensland Police. They are an essential part of our school and the work that we do. Um, it's interesting, um, listening to Robert Davis as I was sitting there going through what he was saying, I'm thinking there's, there's so many overlaps between what he's talking about and what I'm talking about. You know, I could probably just give up now and go and sit down and we could all go to lunch, which I believe is going to be really, really good because that's what police conferences, when they organise it, are really good. They're on time and have great food. So I won't let you off quite that lightly, so I will actually carry on. But, you know, the idea of... Um, context matters and crime prevention is really about the fact that we need regional solutions for regional problems and we need to understand these problems. So in many ways there's a lot of overlaps between the two of them. So before I start, I'd like to do the standard, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend the respect to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. When I say this, one of the things I'd like to talk about is the fact that we are talking about on the land that we are meeting. And this is providing a context, you know, it's about the context in which we're meeting today. And when we look at the Aboriginal nations across Australia, what we discover is, and I'm going to use my notes here so I don't upset my numbers, that there are actually over 500 nations or clans of an, an Aboriginal Australians. Um, there are currently 145 languages spoken, and that's um, a drop of over 100 languages since the beginning of last century, so when there were 250 languages. So this is an extraordinarily complex context that we're actually talking about. Just to put some perspective on that, and which always makes me interested, is that Europe, Europe has 51 independent states, as opposed to 500, and 24 national languages, as opposed to 145. And we think Europe's a complex nation. Think what this actually means in terms of what Australia is. So what I'm saying is that context matters. Context matters in understanding crime, why it happens, it doesn't happen um, randomly across our society, it happens in certain areas. The solutions have got to be focused on those particular crimes. The, um, in May this year, I was asked by the um, Griffith University uh, uh, Indigenous Student Society and the Griffith University Amnesty International Society to talk about um, the um, incarceration of um, the over-representation of young Indigenous people in um, prisons. It was at the... the at that time, the um, Amnesty International just released a report on a brighter tomorrow, um, keeping Indigenous kids in the community and out of detention in Australia. And I'd like to say that I've um, lifted a number of their um, graphics from that report, which I'm going to use in this particular talk. The other place I've um, lifted graphics from is Google, so I'd also like to acknowledge Google um, and the plagiarism that I'm taking straight out of Google um, before I go on. When I put this 
talk together, which is about six, when I put the first talk together about six months ago, and I built very much on that talk into this talk, um, I referred back to the 25 years that we've had since the Commission of Inquiry into um, Aboriginal deaths and custody. I was, I was listening to the last speaker, and there have been so many um, inquiries, and um, I was just thinking this is so similar in Australia. We've had all these inquiries, but one of the key inquiries to understanding the overrepresentation uh, of Indigenous people was the Commission of Inquiry, which was held 25 years ago, and we're in the 25th anniversary, which is one of the reasons why Amnesty International was doing this um, work on um, the overrepresentation of Indigenous people. Since that time, six months ago, we've actually it's, we've had an explosion of additional inquiries with the um, Four Corners report on the Dondale Youth Detention Centre in August this year, which of course has moved into the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory. Um, the Queensland Attorney General uh, has an independent inquiry into Queensland youth detention centres. And of course, last week, as we all know, um, our Attorney General, George Brandis, um, announced the inquiry into the overrepresentation of Indigenous incarceration. So, and this is where I'm starting to sound like the last speaker. So we're 25 years since the um, Commission of Inquiry and the levels of overrepresentation of Indigenous people in our prisons has not um, really changed. It's still a national disgrace. And the question is, what we've been doing up to now, what's, what's working? What, what works in order to be able to address this issue? So I'm going to really focus on the overrepresentation of um, Indigenous young people in detention. What I'm, not going to, what I'm not going to do is show any pictures of Malcolm Turnbull and jump up and down as though he's the hero of a, the Australian society. That's, and he's not, he's not even good looking. I mean, he, <laughs> there's no win-win there. So I won't follow. That's one thing I won't follow on from the previous um, speaker on. So I'm not going to do that. I say I'm not going to list the statistics, but like, you know, I'm really a numbers person, so I probably won't manage to stay there. Um, you know, I really do need to, especially for the international people in the audience, say that um, Indigenous Australians make up about 2 3%, 3% of our population. They make up well over 50% of our youth detention centres, and they make up something like 27% of our adult detention centres. So you can see the level of overrepresentation is really quite considerable. Um, interestingly enough, we actually imprison um, Indigenous people at a higher rate than um, the Americans managed to uh, uh, imprison African Americans. And while our um, imprisonment rate for most Australians is a lot lower than um, the US, we do actually have that where we can actually say that we do it more than they do it. So I'm not going to talk about the statistics, but I will just mention those statistics because I think they provide an interesting context. I'm not going to talk about the high rates of remand. Um, about 60% of our young people in um, detention centres are actually not sentenced. They're actually there on remand, which is an appalling thing. I'm not going to talk about the breaches of the United Nations Conventions on the Right of the Child, although since I put this talk together, it's interesting to see that Queensland has finally managed to move towards taking 17-year-olds out of adult prisons, which is a breach of the convention. What I am going to talk about is crime prevention. I'm going to talk about not just what works, and we've had a lot of focus on what works, but I'm going to talk about what works, for whom, and under what circumstances. And in doing this, I'm going to talk about the fact that community or the context in which we do the um, impl implement um, programs and things is really important. We need to understand the context because nobody lives in isolation. They, Around them is the culture, their family, their history, their peers, and it's all necessary to understand this context in order to be able to understand what will work. So what we're really saying is that simple solutions or cookie cutter solutions or um, the issues that the last speaker talked about are not going to work when we try to address this complex problem. One of the, one of the key things in terms of um, 
what a lot of um, researchers have looked at, and also very much what the um, Commission of Inquiry 25 years ago did, was look at the relationship between colonisation and dispossession and imprisonment. Colonisation and dispossession are two extremely important components of understanding the overrepresentation, the context of the First Nation people and the overrepresentation of um, people in prison. However, um, this is not necessarily a direct relation between these two things. In actual fact, what we have is a back reciprocal relationship between colonise and disposition, offending and victimisation. And I'd like to talk a little bit about victimisation because we frequently, when we talk about offending, we forget that for every offence or for most offences, we actually do have victims. Um, and this high rates of offending is actually what leads to the high rates of imprisonment. When we talk about victimisation within Indigenous communities, 16% um, of homicides in Australia um, involve an Indigenous person either as a victim or an offender, and in 70% of these homicides, the um, victim and offender are both Indigenous. So we have high rates of homicide in our community. Hospital admission rates for women, assault against um, Indigenous women is 38 times the hospital admission rates for assaults against non-Indigenous women. Um, hospital um, admission rates for um, Indigenous males is 27 times that for non-Indigenous males. And Indigenous children are seven times more likely to be substantiated to come to, when they come to the uh, attention of the child protection system, to be substantiated for harm. So what we have in Indigenous communities is extraordinarily high rates of victimisation. And this victimisation is being caused by uh, high rates of offending within, violent offending within these, um, these communities as well. And it's one of the things that um, the previous speaker talked about is this issue to do with um, dealing with offenders but also understanding and, and meeting the rights and needs of victims as well. Um, self-reports of Indigenous people and offending is a lot higher than the self-report of non-Indigenous young people and offending. What we also know is that offending, high rates of offending, especially violent offending, leads to high rates of imprisonment. And um, about 70% of Indigenous people in prison are actually in prison for violent offending. What we also know is that this feeds back on itself. So not only are prisons, in uh, prisons criminogenic, so people who go into prison are actually more likely to come out, more likely to offend than people who don't go into prison. Um, what we also know is that we have an intergenerational problem here. One of the major risk factors for going into prison is um, uh, having parent or par a parent or friend incarcerated or a significant elder incarcerated. Our research shows that um, by the age of 25, almost one in four Indigenous males have been imprisoned in Queensland. This means that for most Indigenous people, they actually have close associations to people in prison. I was really interested when I first heard the statistic, I actually thought about how many people I know outside my work who've actually gone into prison and really there is nobody in my immediate family or friends that has ever been to prison. And when I talk to other people that I know, they say very much the same. But when I actually talk to the indigenous people I know and my indigenous students, you can see them start to count. You know, when you say, how many people do you know, you can see them start to count, and rapidly they lose count. So within the communities that they're coming out of, there's a really high um, rates of incarceration. These are uh, uh, areas which are um, where we have concentrated incarceration. So what we have is a whole community that has been damaged by these high levels of incarceration. And this um, increases the level of crime. So we have this cycling around of people going in and out. We know that people that have been in prison are less likely to be employed, less likely to marry, suffer from a range of medical and psychological problems. So we have a problem there. The other thing that my previous speaker talked about was the relationship between the criminal justice system and imprisonment and what the advantages. And the criminal justice system, of course, is police, courts and corrections, police and courts being two key areas of it. And the issue to associated with systemic bias and do we have systemic bias within the criminal justice system? I would argue that 
If we do, it's really very small. It's not enough to account. We may have 25 years ago when the Royal Commission was around, but now the research we are doing is showing very limited evidence of high levels of systemic bias. So that's not saying that there's not individual bias, but we've done work um, on cautioning and um, youth justice conferencing, so diversion within the Queensland Police. So we've got data and we've looked at the rates of diversion. Now, if you look at cautioning statistics that the QPS puts out, and it puts out how many Indigenous kids it cautions and it puts out how many non-Indigenous, it seems really, really clear that a, a non-Indigenous child is far more likely to get a caution, a police caution, than an Indigenous child. However, if you actually take all that data and you look at the first time that child appears in the, in the um, criminal justice system, or that first time that that person appears, uh, that young person appears before the police, what we then find is almost 90% of all kids are cautioned by police in accordance with the legislation, I'd like to say, the Youth Justice Act, doing an extraordinarily good job. So almost 90% of children, when they first um, hit the criminal justice system, are receive a police caution, a formal police caution. Um, we have slightly less, 88% of Indigenous kids, as opposed to 90% of non-Indigenous kids. This is not evidence of a strong systemic bias. If you go and talk to police about it, they will say, well, we often can't caution an Indigenous child because they won't plead guilty, something that's essential in order to get a caution, and that's because they've got advice, legal advice, not to plead guilty and have their day in court. So we've got a couple of things that might be sitting in the system that gives you this 2% um, uh, differential between Indigenous and non-Indigenous in terms of receiving a police caution, but this is not enough to actually account for the really high levels of overrepresentation in our prison systems. And one of the things we do know from our data on cautioning is that children who, Indigenous children are cautioned at a lot younger age, which means they have many times to come back into this youth justice system. In their second time when they hit the youth justice system, our data shows that they're actually more likely, more likely to get a youth justice conference than a non-Indigenous child at their second appearance. So they tend to go from a course to a youth justice conference and then on to the court system, and then to the court system, and then to the court system, and then to the court system. So it's this high engagement in offending behavior which actually pushes them through the system. The other work that's been done in our school um, is looking at sentencing and sentencing bias. And again, um, there is this question about whether or not um, Indigenous people are more likely to get sentenced to prison than non-Indigenous people. We have very similar sentencing um, principles to what our previous speaker talked about. What the sentencing um, literature shows, or the sentencing research that says, that when you control for all the things you can control, statistically, good evidence, you know, the type of offence, the number of previous offences, et cetera, et cetera, you will find that there is really not strong evidence of systemic negative discrimination, and in some situations we actually have positive discrimination. So indigenous people, when everything's controlled for, are less likely to be sent to prison than non-indigenous people. I would argue that um, many magistrates are as aware and horrified by the overrepresentation of indigenous people in our prison system, and they are putting an unconscious um, positive bias on to try and reduce um, the um, imprisonment levels by not um, sentencing people to prison. It was really interesting, the previous, um, and I think I've just stopped going through my list. So what we can say is offending and victimisation leads to involvement in the criminal justice system, which leads to imprisonment. Um, and I'd like to, again, go back to this idea and about, no, I'm going to keep moving. One of the things that we know is that um, we actually have a cycle between offending and victimisation. So um, the, the work we've done looking at child protection, um, children who come to the attention of the child protection system are far more likely to go on and offend than children who don't come to the attention of the child protection system. Um, so we have this, um, this round and round cycle between offending and victimisation, which I think is um, far more evident in many of the indigenous communities than, than um, it is outside the indigenous. This um, cycle between 
high levels of victimisation, which lead to high levels of offending as people grow up, is what then leads to the high levels of in, uh, intervention in the criminal justice system. And as I pointed out, this leads to high levels of imprisonment, which then feeds back on itself. So we have this, this round and round type of process which people get into this system, and it's very difficult to get out of this system. So, moving right along and not getting myself caught up. So, what I would like to argue that the key to reducing the overrepresentation of Indigenous young people in detention is to reduce offending and their experience of victimisation. And I put that in high levels because that's really an important one. But the real question is how? How do we go about doing this? How do we know what works? And we had a great talk from Peter Martin earlier on talking about evidence-based policing, but you know, we also have evidence-based interventions, many of which are run by police, many of which are going to be talked about in the next two um, conferences, but how do we know what works? So we talked, he talked about processes for actually doing evidence-based um, interventions and how we know what works, but what is also really important is how we know what works for whom and under what circumstances. These are, what we know is that not everything works for the same people in every single situation. Examples of this are the um, domestic violence policing experiment, nice randomised trial, good evidence that arrest works to prevent um, domestic violence. What we then look at is in actual fact it works for people who are um, highly um, socially engaged, they are employed, but if they're not, in, um, if, if this is not, if a person is not um, employed or socially engaged, they're more likely to actually end up being, this is more likely to uh, increase the violence. So we're looking at different circumstances and different circumstances, different strategies work for different people. And we have to understand that. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about things are context dependent. And we can't just do an evaluation on something and think that we're going to pick it up from one place and move it to another place and plonk it down and it's going to work properly. What we do also have to do is understand why things work. I, of course, are coming out and a great advocate of what we call realist evaluation. And um, this is a, a new way. It's not saying that randomised control tiles aren't important, because they are important, and they're important to understand. But there is a lot of other things that we need to understand before we actually talk about what works in, terming, in terms of context. We have two effective crime prevention frameworks that I'd like to talk about. Interestingly enough, um, there's quite a lot of work in this conference around both of these um, crime prevention frameworks, which I hadn't quite realised when I started putting this together. The first of it is situational crime prevention. These are crime prevention where we actually start to target the crime opportunity. So we're actually talking about the crimes rather than about the individuals. And we have a, a a second keynote speaker who's going to come on tomorrow, Kate Bowes from the University um, of University of College London. So she's come all the way to the UK to talk to you about crime science and how crime science can help us in understanding and preventing crime. But we also have a couple of our, my colleagues, two or three of my colleagues this afternoon are running a um, workshop on how, um, looking at situational crime prevention and understanding how to do situational crime prevention. So this is, this, I will talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but the other one I'd like to talk about is developmental and life course criminology, which also um, has quite a long um, evidence base in terms of having strategies that will help us prevent crime. What developmental and life course criminology is interested in is the onset, persistence and desistance offending and understanding how these all work together over a life course. It talks about targeting risk and protective factors, so parental incarceration is a risk factor, employment is a protective factor. It also talks about the importance of systems, all the contexts that people are embedded in. So it talks about the importance of the family system, the school system, the community system, and the economic and political system, and that's what individuals are embedded in, and if we're going to understand what works, we actually have to understand the systems that these people are working on. It's very much what the early intervention, the early developmental intervention, which I'm sure everyone's heard about, but I will talk about a bit more, that framework in terms of preventing crime, and also our therapeutic interventions, the ways we can go about actually preventing people from re-offending. So talking first about um, situational crime prevention strategies. <laughs> 
she says, turning over all her pages so she doesn't do this. So situation have to be tailored to the particular situation or the particular crime. So what will work in one situation or for one crime will not work in another situation or another crime. And I'm sure Kate will talk a lot more about this, but the basic theoretical principles that are running behind situational crime prevention is about increasing the ref effort to cause to commit the crime, increasing the risk of committing the crime, reducing the rewards associated with reducing the crime, removing provocations and removing excuses. So increasing the effort is talking about making people work harder to commit a crime. So doing things around the situation that may make it um, may make it more difficult. Things like opal fuel um, to prevent people from um, petrol sniffing um, is a an example of a, a very effective um, situational crime prevention strategy where it increases the evidence. But of course, it's the sort of strategy that's only going to really work in discrete communities. I mean, if we go into an urban city and put um, opal fuel into three um, petrol stations, it's not going to be an effective strategy for reducing petrol sn sniffing because people will be able to go to a petrol station very close by. Um, so there is this issue about the um, accessibility of opal fuel and whether or not people um, can actually get their hands on it. And if they can't get their hands on it, um, that reduces um, petrol sniffing. Increasing the risk is about guardianship and increasing the level of guardianship. Um, it's a crime prevention through envi environmental design sort of sits into this sort of area. Um, things like school designs, designing schools, primary schools, so that there's lots of natural surveillance. So you can see what's happening out in, inside the classroom and outside the classroom. So people are, are constantly being, um, there's a constant guardianship over what's actually happening in that particular environment, makes those environments safer and more easier, um, makes those environments safer, less likely offended, less likely victimisation. Um, RBTs, randomised um, breath testing, is another example of increasing the risk. So when we have random policing um, going out there and breath testing people, people think that there's going to be a higher risk of them actually getting caught. That reduces their um, likelihood of drinking and driving. I didn't drink and drive last night. I didn't get breathalyzed, but I didn't drink and drive last night. Um, that's because I think there's a high risk of me being caught if I actually drink and drive. Um, reducing the rewards means making things more difficult to be able to actually, uh, making things, making, no, not, sorry, not making it more difficult. Reducing the rewards means making it um, impossible for actually to be able to get the rewards. So things like um, car immobilizers reduces those rewards. People can't actually steal cars. Um, another thing is about um, removing provocations, she said, moving on, is about reducing boredom. Many young people will actually offend because they're bored. So things like PCYC is a good um, reduction of provocations, not bored, off the streets, out of trouble, um, PCYC, sports clubs are all strategies that within this framework have been shown to reduce crime. And removing um, excesses and controlling alcohol and drugs is one of the um, obvious ones. So controlling the actual supply of alcohol and drugs rather than actually controlling people to, to actually control their own ones. So those are situational crime prevention strategies. All of these have an evidence base. All of them are dependent on where you're going to go. And I'm sure that um, a couple of the speakers that are coming after me will talk a lot more about this. What well, works to prevent youth offending? Developmental and life course interventions, which is where we intervene along the life course. We can inter never too early, never too late. Um, the risk factors that we know for offending are parental incarceration, child maltreatment, homelessness, alcohol and substance abuse. So trying to address these specific risk factors is what we're doing when we're using developmental and life course interventions. Um, Protective factors, increasing protective factors are things like school attendance, performance and retention and employment we know are protective against um, offending. So working with these two to um, risk and protective factors, anything that's working with risk and protective factors works in a development and life course intervention, which is a good theoretical framework for understanding how we do.
give every child a key, a best, give every child the best start is your early intervention. I've actually just stolen this from the Boyer lectures, which I'll talk about in the next one. But early, early childhood development is key to health and well-being. This is not necessarily just about offending. This is also about preventing child maltreatment, preventing youth suicide, mental health, academic failure. So we know that programs that are targeted at high-risk um, children and even before birth um, I was talking to a woman in the break about fetal alcohol syndrome. So there we are, a, a classic, if we can actually put programs into place like pre-natal home visits that will actually talk to women who are pregnant about the dangers of um, drinking during pregnancy, smoking during pregnancy. This actually means that we've got good, healthy babies who are more likely to be able to learn, who are more likely to be able to take advantage of any opportunities they give them. So we... Um, this is before birth, before problems emerge, over the life transition, so we know that transitions into school, school readiness is a really important part of making sure that the kids get the best start, which reduces their um, negative life outcomes. And we know there's a number of evidence-based interventions that have been shown overseas to work, pre- and postnatal home visitors, early family parenting programs and preschool education are all evidence-based interventions. But whether or not they work in indigenous communities, whether or not they work with the context that we're working, whether or not we don't know that, we don't have that data and information. And I did, I, I, if, I just put this slide in. I don't know if you've listened to the Boyer lectures on the ABC, um, they are, a really good series, and um, the ones by Michael, Michael Marmot talk about Fair Australia, social justice, and the health gap, and what he's talking about is health inequalities. However, what he really talks about in his first lecture is the links between health and um, crime, and the fact that this is all really obvious, these links between health and crime within Indigenous communities in Australia. So he talks about the social determinants of health, which look very much like our life course criminology, conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And he also talks about inequalities in power, money, resources that give rise to inequalities in the conditions of daily life. And what he talks about is how this gives rise to really poor health outcomes, which we know very clearly in the closing of the gap of um, Indigenous people, that the health outcomes are a, a lot poorer for indigenous people in Australia, but he also talks about the links between those health outcomes and crime. Preventing reoffending. I'm going to finish early. I'm going to finish early. You'll be all pleased to know that. Preventing reoffending. So these are interventions that are formed by theory and empirical research. So what we're talking here about is not just the earlier ones are talking about preventing people from starting offending and the whole range of programs that we can put into pe to place to either stop people from offending because it's harder or it's more risky or to stop people from offending because they have a better life start and this reduces their chances. Once they actually start offending, we needn't throw up our hands in the air and say, oh my God, that's the end of it. They're now caught into the cycle and they're going to go round and round and round and round and round and end up in prison. There are evidence-based strategies that we can put into place that will actually prevent people from reoffending. Um, these are evidence informed by theory and empirical research. Um, what we need to do is match the offender's risk of reoffending, so targeting high-risk people. People who are at high risk of reoffending is a far more effective than targeting people with low risk. Increasing the amount of um, interventions, the higher the risk is worth. Targeting their needs, so not a generic cutty cut, cookie cookie cutter, cookie cutter one, but looking at the particular needs of intervention of people. So um, the sorts of needs that people have. They have complex needs, they have um, cognitive deficits, language needs, 
um, poor education, um, family um, dysfunction, substance abuse, anger issues. So looking at all of those, and also looking at responsivity in terms of therapeutic interventions. That is that, you know, if somebody doesn't speak English, then um, giving them a, a program in English is not really going to work for them. So it's a fairly simple sort of process of targeting particular needs, so an individually focused um, program. But these individually focused programs sit in a far more holistic environment, and they target multiple and extensive needs. And I noticed that this afternoon we've actually got um, uh, some more work that we're doing at Griffith University looking at um, sexual offending in Indigenous communities and looking at a whole range of strategies, including these holistic types of approaches to reducing um, sexual offending in Indigenous communities. As I said, they're delivered in, in community rather than in institutional settings. They should involve significant others, including the family and the community, which is very much coming back to those ideas that they're working, you're working together in order to address the, the issue. They should be culturally a program appropriate. And we should ensure program fidelity. That is, that if we know that a program works here, we don't know if it's going to work here, but when we actually put it into place, we should be using exactly the same strategies as we do here and watching how it evolves over time within that setting. Because you won't, if, it does, if it's working here, you want to put it here and make it work like it should be working in order to make sure that you are using the theoretical and empirical base. And then to start to ad adapt that program to those circumstances that you've got there and to evaluate that process in which you're adapting it to those circumstances so that then you can actually understand how that program interacts with the context and you can pick that all up and put it into the next place. So ensuring program facility is important. What we do know that we have evidence on what prevents reoffending by young people are family-based interventions. We talked about that. Multidimensional treatment foster care. So this is alternative care placements with a strong therapeutic framework. So we, where they're working with people that have got um, good theory, um, a good treatment practices, multimodular interventions that include things like case management, multi-systemic, so they're working with individuals across all the different parts of their society, so working with the individual within their family, within their school, within their health needs, within their welfare needs, whatever the, the needs are, but looking at that person in a whole. Counselling, mentoring programs that are informed by things like cognitive behaviour therapy and social skills training has also got strong evidence. Wilderness programs, but only when they're paired with th therapeutic interventions and vocational education and training programs have all got good evidence base for working. What doesn't work? It's interesting, you know, you put together this what doesn't work and you look at this list of what doesn't work, that we actually have really strong evidence, not only that it doesn't work, but it's actually criminogenic, that these things make it worse. And, you know, every, every year our politicians come up with another run on one of these, you know. So imprisonment and detention doesn't work. We know it's criminogenic. It's not going to make people better. Zero tolerance policies don't work. Boot camps don't work. Shock incarceration doesn't work. Naming and shaming doesn't doesn't work, juvenile curf curfews doesn't work. We have lots and lots of evidence to say none of these things work at preventing. So same old thinking, it leads to the same old results, but it goes round and round. There are systemic bar barriers to effective crime prevention. And I do, I mean, when I say it's not about the criminal justice system, but there are really some serious systemic barriers to effective crime prevention. The focus on uh, punitive results like detention and um, imprisonment is an effect, a systemic barrier rather than rehabilitative. And again, I'm going to refer back to my previous, this previous speaker who did an extremely good job about talking about ways we actually can make the criminal justice system more therapeutic and um, more likely to be able to work in, with indigenous things. Um, reactive um, programs tend to be reactive. Um, policies tend to be reactive rather than being proactive and moving forward. Inadequate funding keeps on coming up all the time. The idea that the funding comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. Um, previous, res uh, previous 
speaker also talked about that. And this an inadequate funding, of course, um, gives you an inadequate length of time for anything to really make a difference, especially when you're looking at your early intervention type strategies. A real shortage of qualified and experienced staff. And I actually think also I might say qualified, experienced indigenous staff, because I strongly agree that, you know, the more indigenous people we can have working in this space, both the therapy space and the policing space, the better. But again, the, they make up 2% of our population. Uh, there's not a lot of them around, and um, we do have a really serious um, shortage of qualified and experienced staff. They're delivered on an ad hoc basis and not appropriately evaluated. Same old story. And the fact is that we're busy trying to deliver these programs into remote and discrete communities, which are very different, a very different context to which many of these programs were developed in and evaluated in. I hope what I've managed to say over the last um, 45 minutes, I'm not doing too badly really, 45 minutes is that community is everything. We really need to understand the context on what we're working, the community and what we worked. Um, really, we're covering what works. We've got theoretical reasons why, but the key is under what circumstances. In Australia, we really do not have the evidence base about what works, so we can, in what circumstances. So the evidence we're bringing on what works tends to come in from overseas. The evidence on why is the theoretical frameworks that are also developed overseas. So bringing them into the Australian context and understanding whether or not they work in an Australian context is an area. And I must say, you know, the AIC does do a lot of work in this area, um, doing evaluations of programs within the Australian context. And the work that we're doing with QPS does actually enable us to evaluate many of the programs that are coming on. But we still need to know a lot lot more about this. So the context of the intervention is extremely important. We need to understand the historical and cultural context in which we're implementing the programs. We need to under understand the opportunity structures around crime. We need to work with communities to implement effective interventions. And we just can't pick up a program or intervention that works in one place and expect it to work in another place. We have to continually evaluate what we're doing in order to be able to understand how we're going to um, prevent victimisation and therefore offending and therefore involvement in the criminal justice system and therefore imprisonment. I've got two additional points I do actually want to make that come up all the time. So these sort of sit out, but I still, justice reinvestment, an extraordinarily good idea. I don't know how many of you know that, but um, the Aboriginal Social Justice Commissioners have been pushing this for a number of years. This is the idea that you take money from the back end of the systems from prisons, which are extraordinary imprint. Uh, expensive and put it into the front end of the system to prevent people from offending and reoffending, and therefore saving money and moving the whole thing back again. Great idea. The only problem is we don't actually really know what to put the money into. So there's no point in saying we're going to take the money from the back end of the system if we don't have the evidence and have evidence-based programs available to actually put it into in the front end of the system. The other thing, and I didn't talk much about the criminal justice system, but we really need to reduce the number of children that we've got in detention centres who are not sentenced. It is really a national disgrace that we have, you know, 60% of children sitting in our prison in our detention centres who haven't actually um, been sentenced to imprisonment. And um, we need to have bail programs. We have, need to have alternative care. Many of these kids are indigenous and need somewhere to be able to go so that they're actually not in detention systems. So final words in terms of reducing overrepresentation of young people in the detention centers. There is no simple answer. There is no one answer. There is no immediate answer. There is no magic bullet. And Every time you listen to a politician, they seem to be looking for one of these solutions. Northern Territory intervention might be one of the ones that I don't even really want to talk about. But there are good initiatives, and we have seen a lot of them here today. I, know, I went through the program, and I thought those, those are really, really great ideas. There are very good initiatives out there that are being implemented. We do need to evaluate them. We need to focus outside the criminal justice system. This is not getting rid of police. It's probably actually talking about police being more pro proactive and looking at alternative interventions. We need to prevent victimisation. We need to build the evidence base. We need to understand the context. Context matters in crime prevention. Thank you very much.